clerk says that there are still people who describe him as a traitor. He was speaking to the SABC's Malelisi Dubasi earlier today. There are still people today describing me as a traitor who come from that old right wing. They still persist in calling me a traitor. Every time I make a public appearance, on the social media, some of them come forward to say that. No, I don't lose any sleep about it. Because I believe what I did was the right thing to do. It was the right thing before God, and it was the right thing between my fellow South Africans. I believed in it, and that's why we did it. So, no, I didn't lose any sleep about it, but yes, it was expected was to be expected from Treernicht and Hartzenberg and those people to react that way. They were deeply shocked, but they wanted to cling to apartheid. All right, so that's uh, former President uh, F.W. de Klerk speaking to the SABC a little bit earlier on today, defending uh, himself and saying that uh, maligned sometimes uh, and he felt that uh, he took a lot of flack and doesn't get enough recognition for that. Well, as you can imagine, on a day like today, uh, people remember that history uh, in a way that they want to and uh, have been sharing their thoughts on social media. And uh, we s take a look at some of your tweets. And uh, uh, Mr. Chauke says, uh, that was a frank expose by the former president. I like his stance that apartheid was wrong and that it was not entirely the pressure from outside that influenced his decision to end apartheid. Conscience, conscience, uh, you say. Uh, Sunny boy, uh, Mkasibe says, uh, hi SABC, it was a very insightful revisit. I'm turning 25 years on the 11th of February, the same day as uh, pre President Mandela came out of prison. Uh, I like what he said, it was uh, their conscience that uh, they abolished apartheid, although he denied apartheid was a crime against humanity. Uh, Rulani Baloy says, uh, former president F.W. Clerk says that he's apologized for apartheid despite many people's remarks. He's not done so sincerely. He says that apartheid was morally unjustifiable. And uh, Calvin Tenga says, Frederick Willem de Klerk trying to justify that apartheid was a crime against humanity. All right, so those are your thoughts on social media. Well, we're now joined now from, from our point stu Seapoint Studios uh, in Cape Town by Dave Stewart, who uh, from the FW de Klerk Foundation. Uh, thanks so much indeed for joining us. Uh, welcome to the program. All right, so 1990, uh, you were around, and I believe you were Cabinet Secretary. So how significant, from your perspective, was that uh, State of the Nation address? Well, I wasn't Cabinet Secretary then. I was uh, the, the head of our communications service. So I looked at the 2nd of February from a communication point of view. Mm. And when Mr. de Klerk was actually making the speech, I was sitting with the local and foreign media in a conclave. <laughs> we started briefing the media, uh, the, the foreign media and the local media, at about six o'clock that morning. And then only when de Klerk had finished his, his, his statement did we let them out to file their stories. But it was very exciting because it was one of the great turning points in South Africa's media history. So um, how much did everybody know in cabinet and uh, beyond about uh, what President de Klerk was going to say? Well, in fact, very, very few people had any idea that he was going to put it all on the table, as I think Alistair Sparks said at the press conference. After he had read F.W. de Klerk's speech, he said, my God, he's put it, he's done it all. He's done it all. So it was an enormous surprise for the media. And we had more international media congregated in South Africa at that time than at any time in our history before or since. All right. So um, former President de Klerk uh, constantly trying to correct or, or give a version of his legacy. A lot of people saying that... Uh, he didn't come to the party willingly and that in the end he was actually forced to. 
Uh, from your perspective, uh, what, what, what does he think? What does he genuinely believe? Well, to start with, uh, F.W. de Klerk is not looking for mm. applauders from this group or that group. We are quite confident that history will judge him in the right perspective. So he's not going around the place saying, look, rec recognize me. That's not what he's doing. What he wants South Africans to do is to recognize the fantastic process that he began on that day and in which all South Africans got together to solve our problems peacefully. We want recognition for that process, the process that culminated in our adoption of a truly non-racial constitution. As for being forced to do these things, it's absolutely not true. Uh, in fact, I think we were stronger at the beginning of 1990 than we'd been for years. The economy had been growing at 2.7% on average during the previous three years. That's a lot higher than today. We no longer faced any military threat from the Soviet Union. Cuban tro troops had been uh, withdrawn from Angola. Namibia was on the way to independence. We had no internal security threat. So the idea that this was forced on de Klerk is completely wrong. But he realized that the balance of forces would never again be so good and, and favorable as they were at the beginning of 1990 to start negotiations. And that's why he moved so rapidly and put it all on the table, as Alistair Sparks said. Well, some people will say that you're remembering history slightly differently because uh, they say that uh, the country was ungovernable at that time and that uh, uh, public opinion, particularly around the world, had turned sharply against South Africa. So that it was very difficult for uh, the, uh, uh, the government at the time to go any other route except to put it on the table, as you say. No, you're quite wrong. In fact, by 1988, law and order had been more or less re-established. And the critically important thing is that by about 1987-88, all of the major parties, especially the ANC and the South African government, had agreed that there would have to be negotiations. There wasn't going to be a revolutionary victory, and there wasn't going to be an armed victory. And those, that's one of the prime requirements for any peace process. So uh, at the end of the 1980s, all of the robots started turning green for a negotiated settlement. F.W. de Klerk had taken over as president of South Africa on the 6th of September, 1989. All parties agreed that there would have to be negotiations. Uh, South Africa no longer faced a military threat on its borders, and it was very serious in 19. 87, 88. So the time was ripe for South Africans to get together to negotiate a, a, a peaceful solution to the problems that had dogged us for over 340 years. Are you suggesting that um, if it wasn't for F.W. de Klerk, that the apartheid regime could have carried on for many more years uh, in the path that it was uh, taking up until that point? Oh, yeah, undoubtedly. The, the, the South African government could have stayed in power for another couple of decades, but under increasingly impossible circumstances, undergrowing isolation, undergrowing threat, undergrowing military uh, threat internally and externally. So it wasn't an option. But the South African government was motivated by the wish, and it's not a strange thing, a wish to find a resolution to these problems that had dogged us for so many centuries. And we saw that this was the best possible opportunity to do so. All right, I want you to listen to a clip that I'm going to play for you now. And uh, this is from a journalist who was working at the time, Matata Tzedu. And I spoke to him a little bit earlier today. And I said to him, so President de Klerk made this speech uh, on uh, the 2nd of February 1990. And I said, could the president be trusted uh, with what would follow? And this is what he said. It, it was important that mm. he wasn't trusted mm. because on the ground, as Anton uh, yeah. uh, uh, was indicating, uh, up here, uh, de Klerk was this man of honor. 
uh, who had released Mandela unbanned all these organizations is bringing democracy but below his system was systematically attacking uh, everybody who would be standing in the way of the national party ensuring that the economic power for example stays uh, uh, the same and, and so you had all the third force uh, 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 problem, people being killed in trains, uh, <clears throat> all those killers sponsored by the same de Klerk. So he had to be not trusted yeah. continuously. And, and for the ANC it was even a big problem, but at what point do you dismantle MK? and your structures. Uh, uh, what if this guy, as you can see, uh, really turns around? What, will, what is your fallback position? Uh, <clears throat> and it, it really took Mandela to, to just bulldoze through all those problems. All right, so Mr. Stewart, you, you heard uh, Matata Tzedu there say that on the high level, he was this man of honor, saying the right things, but below the surface, so much else was going wrong, state-sponsored violence, and we believe that as many as 15,000 people died in the years after that. So, um, was this a man president, but not quite in charge? Yeah, well, look, uh, we had faceless violence from all sides. Uh, we, we had uh, an escalation of deaths between 1990 and 19, 1960 and 1994, we lost about 23,000 people in political violence, which is maybe uh, 4,000 more than we lose every year in murders. Eh? Most of this violence arose uh, from the conflict between the ANC and the IFP and KwaZulu-Natal and Southern, and Southern Transvaal. The, there were faceless elements in the state that were also responsible, and and one of de Klerk's greatest uh, problems was ensuring that the truth became known about where, what the sources of violence were. And that's why he appointed the Goldstone Commission and, and cooperated with the Goldstone Commission at every step of the way. And the Goldstone Commission issued a lot of reports on the sources of violence. A lot of them were... Uh, were the responsibility of the IF, IF, IFP. A lot were attributed to the ANC. Some were attributed to the security forces. So it was a very difficult and volatile uh, situation during which faceless people who wanted to stop the negotiation process were committing violence, hoping that the whole thing would fall down into chaos. And those people were on all sides. All right, okay, perhaps as a final question, what would you like um, F.W. de Klerk's legacy to be, particularly as we look back on this day? The legacy is the constitution that all South Africans negotiated between 1991 when Cadessa started and 1996 when we adopted our final constitution. That constitution contains all of the values that we require to become a successful and peaceful and free society. So I think the greatest legacy would be for South Africans to reaffirm their commitment to those values. All right, Mr. Stewart, we're going to have to leave it there. Thanks so much indeed for joining us on the program today. That's a pleasure.